<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Alden. I'm here to chair this uh, panel today on looking at um, uh, research on Chinese firms in Africa, insights and lessons from field work. And I think that's what's very important about the work we're going to hear about today, is that we have with us a panel of experts who've done field work. They've not just reflected upon, but they've gone out there and done what we've, uh, the, the evidence-based research that is always necessary to confirm, uh, challenge, uh, reaffirm perspectives or develop new perspectives on, on topics. And that's, that's the case here. Um, as as uh, I'm not going to say too much about it, because I think the, the point is to hear the speakers and hear how they've uh, seen this. We have three speakers and a discussant. Um, uh, uh, in order of presentation, uh, Barry Southman, who's a professor at Hong Kong Science and Technology University. Um, he, he's uh, been, he was not part of this project as such, but invo involved for a long time in this particular field and has done a great deal of uh, work on the, on the role of firms, the perspectives and insights uh, of of the debates around uh, the Chinese role in labor and, and African labor in that as well. So for that, he is going to be speaking. We'll be followed by uh, Carlos Oya, who's a reader in political economy of, of development and, and is in fact the, the project leader or principal investigator on this particular project at, uh, and is based of course at SOAS, University of London. Um, he's going to look at, uh, again, in, in a, a more general way about the field work, the challenges of methodology and access, and how this impacts upon our understanding of, of uh, the China-Africa question when it comes to labor, <coughs> firms, etc. And then we're, uh, our last speaker will be uh, Xiaoyang Tang, Tang Xiaoyang, who's a researcher, <coughs> research scholar and deputy director of the, of the Carnegie um, uh, Tsinghua Center of Global Policy. Uh, in Beijing. Uh, he's a project researcher and has brought in, um, exam is examining this topic from the perspective, the Chinese perspective and, and the field work he's done over the years in topics in the same venue and topics related to it. Then finally we have a discussant, uh, Linda Calabrese, who's a senior research officer here at the ODI and is going to uh, unpick, unpack in a, in a uh, good way um, the, the comments and, and presentations we have here. A couple of, of things before we leap in. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to reflect and review it and, and uh, in fact, uh, tweet it forward and all of those things. The hashtag is on, on the, the top there. We have 20 minutes per presentation. I'm uh, going to be uh, strict about it. This is a, both a warning, uh, a friendly warning to my people here at the table. And uh, yeah, let us begin. Barry. Well, before I begin uh, talking about the topic that you see up there, localization of Chinese investments in Africa. I've been asked to say a few words about uh, basically how we did this research. That is particularly uh, how we were able to do interviews uh, in connection with this topic. Uh, and So I just want to spend two minutes about that, uh, saying some of the places or some of the sources from which we were able to gather information through interviews. Now, altogether, we've done about 500 interviews in Africa, about half with Chinese and about half with uh, Africans from about a dozen different countries. Uh, I'll mention the, the, these places or sources to which we went very quickly. First of all, the commercial and economic sections of uh, Chinese embassies in various African countries. And normally people don't associate that with getting any decent information. But surprisingly enough, we've been able to go to this uh, out these outposts of the Ministry of Commerce uh, in various African countries, and they have helped to facilitate access uh, to Chinese companies. Uh, also, Chinese chambers of commerce are increasingly found in African countries, and they're uh, often quite willing to talk about the endeavors of uh, Chinese companies. Then the associations that exist among uh, ethnic Chinese in African countries, among Hua Chao and Huaren, uh, 
uh, that is uh, people of Chinese descent, mostly from China, of course, who have set up businesses in Africa. And uh, they also have been very helpful. Uh, the headquarters of companies uh, from China in Africa that exist within China itself. That is, of course, there are many subsidiaries of uh, Chinese-based companies that operate in Africa. If you go to their headquarters, you get on good terms with them first. Uh, they can help to facilitate interviews uh, with their subsidiaries. Uh, then uh, Chinese friends um, who have relatives who have worked in Africa. This is actually a really good source of getting good interviews. If you have some friends uh, and they are from a professional background or their families are, they will almost inevitably now have somebody within their family or close friends who have worked in Africa. So we've gotten some good interviews that way as well. Uh, Chinese media in Africa, naturally they go around and interview people all the time, so they have lots of different contacts. Um, the kind of questions they ask are very different from the kind of questions we ask, of course, uh, but what we're interested in is them helping us to gain entree, and they sometimes do that. Now, in terms of the, the African side, uh, African government development agencies are pretty much always willing to talk, although uh, the quality of the information they get is sometimes is lacking because they don't have enough personnel, uh, and uh, often the, they have difficulty prying out information from the companies that are there. Um, African uh, government sectoral ministries, like for example, ministries of agriculture or uh, ministries of industry, etc., uh, can also be helpful sources for interviews. Although uh, in some African countries it's rather difficult because you have to uh, go through the permanent secretaries, get their permission first in order to gain access to the companies. Uh, then trade unions, which have been one of our best sources of information because we're particularly interested uh, in employment relations. So we've uh, done surveys uh, through the help of trade unions. Uh, African intellectuals, uh, especially people who are political analysts, uh, we see the same ones over and over again. They uh, update us on their opinions and uh, uh, provide valuable information. Africans who studied in China, there are quite a number, of course, who've returned to their home countries, are working for Chinese companies. They have their old boy networks or old boy and old girl networks and often provide interesting information as well. Uh, and then, of course, there are the people we survey. We've done various surveys uh, among both Chinese and Africans. And uh, the people who we survey, we try to interview at least a portion of them. So those are some of the uh, sources of information that we have been able to tap into. Uh, finally, I just want to say one thing about reliability of data, because I'm going to talk about some data now. Uh, we do interviews. Uh, there are articles in the mass media, African media, Chinese media, world media. Uh, and then there are various local sources, some of which I've already mentioned. Uh, you can try to triangulate that information. Uh, if you're dealing with a subject like the one I'm about to talk to, uh, then the information almost naturally is mostly in the hands of companies themselves. And those companies themselves, uh, if they're a listed company, will have filings uh, on stock exchanges in which they have to reveal some information. Uh, of course, we do on-site observation. Uh, and we access also some non-government, non-Chinese sources, foreigners in Africa, for example, who can uh, provide somewhat different perspective. So that's all I'll have to say about that because that's all the time I have. I'll now switch to talking about uh, the main topic here, localization. Uh, the most widespread persistent myth of uh, China and Africa has been the claim uh, that Chinese enterprises in Africa do not hire Africans. And some top U.S. leaders have talked about that. Uh, some uh, big U.S. journalists have talked about it. You can uh, read the quote there. Uh, there have been several studies, though, done about the localization of workforces in Chinese enterprise <coughs> enterprises in Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> most um, Western media uh, <clears throat> have articles that are about uh, China and Africa, and they repeat the claim that Chinese don't hire Africans. Uh, 
but uh, there is uh, some substantial evidence to the contrary. I'll just mention a few studies that have been done uh, in recent years, a study by some Dutch scholars of firms in Uganda uh, showing about a 90% rate of localization in the workforces uh, of those companies. A study in two four, 2014 uh, in Kenya of 75 Chinese enterprises, uh, which again shows about a 90% rate of uh, localization in the workforces with regard to manufacturing and construction, and a somewhat lower rate uh, in the service sector. And then the very large-scale study done this year by McKinsey and Company, a business consulting firm uh, in the United States, of 1,000 Chinese enterprises uh, in eight African countries, where the average rate of localization uh, w went from 60% in Angola to a high of 96% in Nigeria, with an overall rate of 89%, but of course, a much lower rate among managers. Um, <coughs> Well, the media uh, often attributes this uh, supposed Chinese non-localization of workforces and a non-adaption uh, to local laws or customs to uh, various traits that they associate with Chinese, uh, venality, ignorance, or ethnocentricity. Uh, but there's really no evidence uh, that Chinese are more venal, ignorant, or ethnocentric than anyone else. Uh, and to assume so, we always argue, uh, reflects probably some sort of racial or political bias on the part of the people who make these assertions. Uh, indeed, some counter evidence exists with regard to the question of ethnocentricity. Uh, a study that was done in the United States and China among students found that American students were much more ethnocentric than their Chinese counterparts. Now, there also um, is our own project on the localization of Chinese enterprises in Africa, kindly funded by the Hong Kong government. Uh, we have used thousands of documents and actually more than 500 interviews now in 12 countries, particularly in our field site, main field site country of Zambia, uh, to build a database on uh, Africans within Chinese uh, enterprise workforces. So we've uh, gathered descriptive statistics uh, for more than 800 enterprises, and construction projects, industries, and countries in Africa. So uh, it's not quite as large as the one I just mentioned uh, for McKinsey and country, but company, but it uh, encompasses more than 45 African countries. Uh, well, our findings have been uh, that while Chinese investment in Africa, um, oops, forgot to click. Our findings have been uh, that while Chinese uh, investment in Africa mostly dates uh, from the 21st century, workforce localization has been there from the outset, and it's become more advanced as time goes on. Almost uh, all Chinese enterprises and projects in Africa, regardless of their size, have a majority African workforce. There's quite a bit of variation uh, from country to country and from sector to sector. But the overall average uh, is in the mid-80s, which puts us in line with the other studies which I mentioned earlier. Uh, most Chinese managers in Africa who we've interviewed uh, have strongly said that they want to deepen localization as circumstances permit, especially contingent on the availability of skilled local personnel. Uh, outside of Africa, uh, Chinese enterprises uh, in most countries are in fact highly localized, although there are some exceptional places like uh, Central Asia and the Caribbean. And there's no convincing evidence that we can find uh, that Chinese enterprises in Africa are significantly less localized than our other foreign enterprises. But that's something which we can't completely determine because surprisingly enough, it's actually easier to get statistics in this regard from Chinese companies or about Chinese companies than it is to get them from non-Chinese foreign investors in Africa, uh, except perhaps in the oil industry. Well, the differences between non-Chinese and uh, Chinese investors on localization, uh, we would argue, are much more structural than they are ideational. Uh, Western firms have certainly been in Africa longer than Chinese firms. Uh, this longer tenure uh, means that uh, there has been more continuous access on the part of Western firms investing in Africa to skilled labor. Uh, 
Of course, Western firms have the advantage of having their managers speaking the various colonial languages, uh, and they share other cultural elements as well with Africans, uh, which Chinese don't necessarily do. And uh, they are seen by many Africans as being white companies, and thus they are assumed uh, to be competent, uh, to be high paying, to be ethical, etc. This, after all, is the discourse in the world. Uh, and, of course, there are even more financial incentives for Western companies to localize, particularly their management, uh, than there are for Chinese companies because they pay higher salaries to their expats than Chinese companies do. Uh, Chinese firms' activities uh, require using more locals uh, than other firms' activities as well. Uh, Chinese are more involved in construction and manufacturing in Africa than Western investors but they have to contend with an acute shortage of engineers, technicians, and skilled workers. Actually, there's a worldwide shortage of engineers and certain categories of skilled workers. Tanzania, for example, I'll show you the figures here. Uh, Tanzania has uh, a very low ratio of engineers to population, even more so uh, with Kenya and Zimbabwe. And you can see the comparisons with Hong Kong and <coughs> the Chinese mainland. Uh, Chinese also do more tightly scheduled uh, government projects uh, than other foreign firms do in Africa. Uh, some of these projects are uh, highly sensitive politically. Uh, often uh, they have to be completed before election time in African countries, so to build railways, build roads, etc. Uh, then uh, they become, it becomes imperative that they be finished on time. And that, that means that uh, Chinese companies often have to hurriedly bring in large numbers of skilled workers to complete projects on time. Uh, many Chinese enterprises are also low profit. Uh, the much higher profits that Western enterprises have uh, allow them to pay higher salaries than Chinese companies can uh, provide, and thus they attract, that is the Western companies or other non-Chinese companies, tend to attract uh, more skilled labor than the Chinese companies do on that account alone. Uh, Chinese SOEs are also, Chinese state-owned enterprises, are more likely than uh, Western and other investors to uh, consider political factors uh, when they are making decisions about how to carry out their work in Africa. An example of this is the uh, Sambu, three nose policy uh, that the Chinese state-owned enterprise uh, CNMC carried out in Zambia during the global uh, financial crisis. For political reasons, uh, they said that they would not lay off anybody, despite the fact that all the other uh, foreign-owned copper mining companies were laying off people. They would scale back their investments, and they would halt any uh, plans for new investments. So uh, in addition, more recently, uh, Chinese firms have kept many uh, Chinese employees at uh, oil mining and other work sites in South Sudan, even during the ongoing civil war. They kept people on site uh, during the Ebola crisis in West Africa. And uh, Chinese firms did not significantly scale back their activities during the recent economic downturn in Ghana. So. Our empirical conclusion is, whoa, I have five minutes more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, our empirical conclusion is that uh, Chinese firms' localization uh, is in some respects worse than that of uh, other investors in Africa. It's worse in the sense that there are generally fewer local managers than there, than, uh, there are at other foreign investors, uh, fewer local engineers. Uh, for the reasons that I've just talked about. Uh, also, it's the same in most aspects. Um, if you make a comparison between Chinese firms and uh, other foreign investors, uh, that is, there is the same high overall uh, proportion of locals uh, in non-Chinese and Chinese firms. But it's also better in some ways uh, than is the case with uh, some non-Chinese firms investing in Africa. And what's better tends to be what's political. That is, the Chinese firms uh, 
uh, do have to take into account political considerations. Uh, this is true not only of the state-owned enterprises, but also, to some extent, of private enterprises. We typically dichotomize the two and think, well, state-owned enterprises are the enterprises at the orders of the Chinese government. And of course, that's true to some extent, but even that's not completely true because state-owned enterprises in China often will proceed on their own, ignore what the government is telling them. There, of course, are enterprises at all different levels from China, from the central government, from provincial governments, from municipal governments, etc. Private enterprises, surprisingly enough, although they don't have to obey orders from the Chinese government, often will take into consideration the policies and plans of the Chinese government. They often, for reasons of, uh, well, for very sound reasons economically, try to have good relations with the Chinese government. And therefore, they too um, will often try to uh, adopt policies close to those which the Chinese government is trying to promote. Uh, this is, of course, by no means uh, an everyday occurrence, but at times uh, when it seems to be particularly politically useful to do so, even private enterprises will take this stance. And that, of course, contrasts with the attitudes of Western investors. They are certainly not uh, going to be ordered around by their home governments. In fact, uh, they generally have more influence on the home governments than the home governments have on them. So uh, this is, I think, the one area in which uh, it could be argued that with regard to localization and perhaps with some other areas, uh, Chinese companies may do better than other foreign investors. Well, I have uh, actually have a few minutes left over, but I will gift those to the other people on the panel. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, can I have the... Oops. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present now. Before I present, I would like to um, show my appreciation to ODI and the DFID ESRC Growth Research Program for hosting us and, and giving very generous support to um, organize this event. And um, I'm following on, on Barry's very important presentation. I'm probably going to skip the first couple of slides, which uh, pretty much talk about what um, um, Barry has, has told us. Basically, when, when we started this project, the, the, the background was one where you could see all sorts of claims and counterclaims, especially on issues of localization, but not only also on issues of whether work conditions were particularly exploitative in Chinese firms compared to, to other firms, uh, debates about you know, work ethic clashes and the differences between, in perspectives between African workers and, and Chinese employers. And interestingly, coming from, from a, a, a research background in labor issues in Africa, I was all, you know, very often mystified by some of these claims and, and debates, which seem to be completely oblivious of the realities of labor markets in, in the countries that um, you know, people were talking about. Um, so counterclaims, again, uh, you know, research like you know, what Barry and, and other people have done, and different types of uh, empirically grounded research, which has shown a much more diverse picture. And, and perhaps the good news is that the field has been evolving in the last 10, 15 years, so it is now easier, in a sense, to debunk some of the uh, most uh, problematic myths, and, and this is the right time to get into more interesting questions. And, and, and that is pretty much the background to our research project, so for those of you who are um, expecting to see lots of findings and so on, I'm sorry I'm going to disappoint you, uh, because this project is right now halfway. Uh, we have just completed the, the bulk of data collection, uh, but of course we need to process and analyze the data from the survey. So I'm going to give you, basically my focus is going to be on, on, on the research process and some of the difficulties that arise for you know, anyone, any researcher willing to do research on these issues. And I think I'll, I'll try to uh, 
um, uh, illustrate um, why also this kind of research is so scarce. It's, it's, it's because of the challenges that it entails. And before that, let me just give you a sense of the research questions that guided our uh, project. Uh, of course, we asked questions around issues of localization and the, the quantity of jobs, so to speak. I think one point that relates to what Barry has just presented is, is one thing is talking about localization in terms of percentages of the workforce uh, that are local in Chinese firms and other, or the foreign firms, and also in, in our case, we looked at national domestic firms in, in two countries, in Ethiopia and, uh, and in Angola. But it's also about the actual, you know, the absolute creation of jobs. And it is true, uh, particularly in the case of Ethiopia, there is enough secondary evidence which suggests that when you look at foreign direct investment, and especially in the sectors of construction and manufacturing, Chinese firms account for a very, very large proportion of all the jobs that have been created in the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years there. So in terms of actual job creation, um, there's no, there's no doubt that the, um, um, there has been quite substantial creation of jobs of different kinds, and of course the bulk of jobs that have been created are unskilled, semi-skilled jobs, not the sort of jobs that uh, um, Barry was referring to when talking about managers and you know management level and engineers, for for obvious obvious reasons. So we were trying to basically our <coughs> research was organized around creating a comparative, sufficiently rigorous comparative framework. To, uh, that would allow us to compare like with like as far as possible to see whether conditions were better or worse on what uh, aspects of, of the work, uh, of the labor relation. And, um, and also trying to link uh, the evidence that we collect on conditions through large scale quantitative surveys to what we know from secondary evidence of uh, labor relations in these sorts of sectors, specifically in China. Uh, a related question is precisely to what extent and why uh, Chinese firms, and for the matter also other uh, non-Chinese firms, exporting labor regimes and practices. Uh, and when, when we think about labor regimes and practices, we must think about them in terms of their sectorial specificity. There are particular labor regimes that are common in certain manufacturing sectors, or the labor regimes that are more common in you know, some forms of uh, construction and, and so on. So from that uh, um, secondary evidence, we, we will be able to, to see uh, whether indeed there is a process of exporting or, or trying to, to bring a model of labor relations, or whether companies actually have no option but to adapt and, and, and engage in, in, in a flexible uh, adaptation according to the, to the context. So you know, our hypothesis indeed is that there is actually a lot of adaptation, although of course, companies come from their own background and they're used to certain labor regimes and it is expected uh, for them to, to try to implement these regimes in, in different contexts. Now, for us, I think the, mo <coughs> excuse me, the most uh, useful or interesting questions are not so much uh, whether you know, our conditions will be worse, better, or average, or the same, is whatever differences we find, um, what really explains these differences, and, and that's where there is a, a huge range of factors that can explain labor market outcomes. Anyone with a bit of experience in this field will, will know that. So we will try to see to what extent, for example, sector specificities uh, determine the type of labor relations that uh, um, affect different types of companies from different origins. Equally, the types of jobs uh, uh, within those sectors uh, will provide another source of, of variation. Um, uh, of course, even within the sector, within the same group of companies, if you take Chinese companies, you're likely to find some variation. And indeed, from our qualitative research, we could already sense variation in terms of corporate practices and you know, how to deal with the different contexts and different constraints. Not only in terms of uh, different contexts across countries, but also different contexts within the same country. And in, in, in this respect, our experience of research in Angola was particularly interesting because we started the research at a critical conjuncture where the crisis was hitting um, after the collapse of the oil prices. That had a knock-on effect on various economic activities, especially in the construction sector, and that affected um, also labor relations in, across all Chinese and non-Chinese companies in this sector. So that also gives us another source of variation that may be of interest. So <clears throat> in terms of methodology, let me just give you a flavor of what we did and, and how and in what sequence. Um, for this kind of uh, research, obviously, you start with uh, um, a process of literature reviews and database search. 
Um, surprisingly, actually, we did find quite a lot of evidence, secondary evidence, not just Barry's work, but also the work of other uh, people uh, in this field. So there's actually much more evidence than we thought on labor relations in Chinese firms in Africa, and generally more towards the counterclaims that I mentioned before. Um, so we've, we've got all that background, and we engaged then in fairly extensive qualitative scoping research, which took many, many months, eight, nine, ten months, depending on the context, essentially to prepare the grounds and the conditions for large-scale end sample surveys. Um, we, did, uh, um, we chose two countries, Angola and Ethiopia, which are particularly relevant, probably two of the best possible case studies to understand and explore these uh, issues. Uh, partly because in quantitative terms, these are two big players in the China-Africa uh, field. Uh, they are uh, always in the top three or four of um, recipients of FDI, of constructed overseas projects from Chinese companies, and, and so on. And also, these are two countries that provide a, a fairly interesting contrast. They're extremely different as, as a policy and historical context. And, and therefore, what you would expect is uh, some significant differences uh, in terms of how the same companies in the same sectors operate, uh, given the, uh, the differences in, in, um, in policy framework and labor market dynamics and so on. Um, so we completed very recently, you know, a few weeks ago, the last few surveys, and we managed to have six, almost 700 workers across Chinese, non-Chinese firms in construction and manufacturing in Angola, and 840 in Ethiopia, again, uh, with more from manufacturing and, uh, and, and less from construction. And this is the uh, distribution of our samples, 40 companies in Ethiopia, 14 of them Chinese. And you can see that the breakdown of, of uh, uh, workers, of the sample, by manufacturing and construction, 539 and 300 in the case of uh, Ethiopia. Um, for Angola, we had um, 36 companies, 17 of which uh, Chinese, and 682 workers distributed more or less, you know, 45, 55% between construction and manufacturing, pretty much reflecting the relative importance of these two sectors. In Angola, the construction sector is the, 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 the main creator of jobs, of these kinds of jobs, whereas in Ethiopia, the manuf manufacturing sector has been growing uh, very fast in the last uh, five to, to six years. In terms of the uh, characteristics of our sample, um, we only interviewed African workers, so this is not a, s a survey of Chinese workers. Um, in terms of localization, I mean, I'll say something maybe afterwards, but pretty much uh, along the lines of what Barry has, has said, quite substantial localization, especially when you're looking at unskilled and semi-skilled labor. Um, in order to, uh, one important thing in this kind of exercise is making sure that your comparisons are uh, sufficiently rigorous. I mean, one problem with a lot of the claims that have been circulating is that, you know, people are comparing apples with bananas, basically. Uh, so when we look at one sector, we don't just, you know, do the whole manufacturing sector. It would be foolish. So for each of the uh, two countries, we selected key sectors where the presence of Chinese companies was significant, but where the variation in terms of the parameters, the criteria wasn't too uh, too, too significant. So uh, in Ethiopia, we worked on, on the textile and garment and the foodwear sector, very you know, light industry, labor-intensive industries, whereas in Angola, really, what's been developed in, in the post-war period is the construction material sector with very strong linkages with the construction boom, boom of, the, of the early 2000s. Um, for construction, again, it's a very heterogeneous sector. It would be uh, um, nonsensical to have a mix of residential, real estate, development, and so on. So we decided to go for road construction, uh, which was quite important in both, in both countries. And that, again, reduces a lot the, the amount of variation that you're, you can expect because the contractors are supposed to be fairly similar. In fact, you can only uh, uh, accept in, in, in both countries only the highest graded contractors could be uh, eligible for, for such projects. So in a sense, that reduced the, the scope of the relevant firms to be compared. So in a sense, the outcome of all this is that what we're comparing is Chinese firms operating in these sectors, in, these, in this particular segment, uh, to the top. Uh, so we, we're sort of using the top benchmarks, uh, um, those firms and those subsectors where we're going to expect the best working conditions. So whatever we find, that would be the comparator. It won't be the average, uh, uh, which, is, which is an important thing to bear in mind. 
So let me say something about the main challenges that you face when do doing this kind of research. Obviously, the main, the biggest, the single most important challenge is the topic. Nobody wants to talk about labor issues, uh, particularly companies. And I have to say that, uh, I think Barry also made a similar comment, uh, Chinese we didn't find Chinese firms particularly uh, more resistant than other firms. In fact, if you were to ask me, you know, give me your t top five of the, uh, the most difficult firms in terms of doing this survey, probably you would find maybe one Chinese company in the top five, and, um, and the top five would include a British company. So um, no, uh, no clear um, difference between the two groups. All firms are reluctant to, to talk about labor issues. I mean, they're not reluctant to talk about labor issues if you interview managers. They're reluctant to allow teams of enumerators enter the premises and interview their workers uh, following uh, rigorous sampling methods, stratify random samples. Um, so that's the kind of thing they don't like for all sorts of reasons. Uh, they want to pick their workers, but also uh, they don't want you to disrupt the production process, especially if you're working in, in factories. So some of these reasons are fairly um, understandable. Now, the sectors themselves were also sensitive. Um, both road infrastructure and factories are quite important for the government's place because of the strategic importance of these, of these projects, and therefore allowing foreign researchers, even with local partners going into these companies, required a huge amount of bargaining and negotiation at uh, essentially uh, government level. Um, the countries themselves, Ethiopia and Angola, as I say, from the point of view of our research questions, probably the most relevant countries. From the point of view of uh, in, you know, easygoing uh, research, probably one of the most difficult in the continent, especially Angola, where there is very little research culture, very little uh, um, uh, used to surveys, especially quantitative surveys. So that was a, a, um, a big source of, of constraint for us. Sensitivity of, of firms already mentioned that. Chinese state-owned enterprises, which dominate in, in Angola, definitely in part in, in Ethiopia, the construction of roads, are particularly difficult to access. Everyone knows that. And you need to follow and find the right channels in order to make sure that you, you get uh, uh, permission. Um, in, in order to build the sampling frames to get the right lists of companies, et cetera, that was also a major uh, problem, particularly in Angola, where secondary data, especially in employment, are uh, simply non-existent, or you know, those that are published are, are, not, are not reliable. Uh, so that required quite a lot of time for triangulation and cross-checking and going quite in, in depth into the existing list of companies for different sectors and trying to have the same information from, from at least two different sources. I've already mentioned the question of fluidity of the sectors and the problematics of Angola during the crisis in 2015 and 16, and of course the logistical challenges normal to the visits to remote construction sites. So basically every single company of the list that I've, I've mentioned there was, was a struggle uh, uh, in order to, to be able to uh, implement the survey. So how did we manage? So it was a mixture, like you know, in the case of Bari, a mixture of channels, tools, and, and weaponry, if you want. Um, we were very careful in terms of the introduction to the project, bear, bear in mind the various sensitivities of the different actors. So we did, we did adapt, in a sense, the blurb about the project to uh, the different respondents, whether they were company managers, government officials, depending on what departments. So everyone in the team had to know uh, what to say uh, to whom. Um, we did work, I mean, that was one of the key uh, goals, to work to get buy-in, essentially from local governments. What, what, what became clear after a few months of scoping was that if we got the uh, um, laissez-passer, uh, to use that expression, from government, especially from key departments, from the Ethiopian and the Angolan government, basically we had 90% of the job done. Particularly in the construction sector, even if the companies do not want to entertain your surveys, if the road authority asks them, to do so, they will have to do it because they are the client. Um, so once we understood that, basically, you know, we managed to uh, secure the support from from these institutions, which wasn't just in the form of simple letters. It was also, you know, more uh, active support on the part of some key participants in these some key allies within these these departments. We also work with very able local institutional partners, especially the university in Angola, which uh, allows us to also open lots of doors. Uh, very strong field teams, I'll show a picture of one of them uh, later on, with multiple roles, including some locally hired Chinese assistants with experience in the country, also with the right contacts. 
We worked a lot through informal networks of connections with firms, exactly the same as Barry was, was telling us before, and snowballing from those connections, so doing a lot of uh, networking. Uh, and particularly, that was uh, critical in the case of Angola. Although in Angola, it took a long time to get the government uh, uh, um, buy-in. Uh, before we got that, we managed to already do quite a lot of qualitative scoping because of these informal connections. And very frequent scoping research trips, visits to companies, government institutions, ensuring confidentiality, anonymity, that also took time to explain, believe it or not, and a lot of patience. Uh, also things, very simple things like, you know, WhatsApp. Uh, incredibly important and useful for troubleshooting and helping teams on the ground when they uh, faced uh, uh, resistance from local level site management. Uh, because one thing is getting the okay from the headquarters of the company in Luanda or in Addis Ababa, different thing is sending a team to remote area construction site where the local uh, um, uh, chief or, or, or site manager we might not be informed or might be playing games with, with our team. In that case, then there was a lot of back and forth through WhatsApp and, and WeChat and, and many other social you know, media. Um, five minutes, good. So that was, uh, I'm going to now give you flavor, uh, only of some of the emerging findings, I mean, some of the things that we expect. But as I say, you know, this will come up probably at the end of next year when we will be able to say something based on the very large scale surveys that I've mentioned before. But the qualitative research gave us a flavor of some of the things, and Xiaoyong Tang will also present some of them uh, um, based on his own uh, field work in Angola more recently. So uh, I will just select a number of, of points. One thing that has become quite clear, especially through the scoping research, is national context does matter. Probably matters more than the, than the supposed flag of the firms. Um, so there are, there are critical differences between the Ethiopian and Angolan context, but. Uh, generally in the terms of the political economy and the political settlements in these countries, but also in terms of the specific sectors we were uh, looking at. So of course, even on the issue of localization, uh, Barry already mentioned that Angola is the, is the basket case when it comes to localization, is where you find the lowest proportion of, of, of workers, uh, whereas Ethiopia is actually much better. And, and that has to do with several factors, but one of them is certainly government policy. And specifically, for example, the strict regulations governing the uh, issuing of visas in Ethiopia for certain uh, occupations, which you know pretty much constrains companies in terms of uh, what they do. Sector and job differences do matter a lot. Clearly, the scope for learning and security varies hugely between manufacturing and construction in the sense these two sectors are a very good uh, uh, platform to explore the extent to which sector matters. But also, when we look at manufacturing, we'll see you know quite substantial differences between even footwear, footwear and textile and garment, or textile and garment uh, factories, depending on the labor intensity and uh, the skill intensity of some of, these, some of these jobs. Company management also seems to matter. Uh, it was quite striking to find quite interesting variation among Chinese firms, just based on interviews with company managers, but also similarities between Chinese and non-Chinese firms in terms of how they uh, they, they, they make sense of the labor processes and conditions and how they explain the way the, the labor practices, As part, particularly when you look at factories, manufacturing sector. So it is quite hard to establish a clear pattern of exported labor regimes or practices that can clearly differentiate Chinese firms from other foreign, foreign or domestic firms. There are some commonalities that some patterns that seem to emerge, particularly in the case of Angola, which we will be exploring with the data from the large-scale surveys. Um, <clears throat> but while proportion of workers seem, you know, has steadily increased in Angola, clearly they seem less able to mobilize domestic workforces. That seems to be a function of the experience of each company in the country, how many years they've been operating in the country, issues about communication barriers, and also the nature of the project, uh, uh, of the actual project, whether it's EPC, subcontracting, or what. That tends to have an impact on the basic issue of, of localization. And of course, what Barry already mentioned, which is the, uh, the political expediency of some of these projects and, and the constraints and the, the, the way, for example, the Angolan government treats and uses Chinese contractors very differently from the other contractors. I mean, not least because, you know, 90% of Angolan contractors are all owned by a very small group of the elite around the Dos Santos regime. Uh, so you can, you know, these are essentially different segments of the construction sector. Uh, 
and therefore that needs to be borne in mind. Now, <coughs> what was, seems to be interesting is that Chinese firms do something that other firms don't seem to do, which is trying to establish migrant labor regimes with an associated dormitory labor regimes. That is in the case of Angola, not so much in the case of Ethiopia. And that has to do with the difficulties that some of these firms have faced in areas like around Luanda, in terms of mobilizing and uh, uh, workers and in terms of workers' retention. So as a result of this, because they're basically tapping into different workforces, we're going to have different labor supplies, different segments of the workforce for different sets of companies. So for example, for many Chinese construction firms in road building, we're likely to find uh, many more workers of rural origin who are poorer, younger, and less educated. And that's because of the places where they come from, compared to many of the other contractors who are operating basically based on labor forces who are based in, in Luanda or other uh, bigger cities. So that will have an impact in terms of understanding the differences in working conditions. Let me just finish with a couple of pictures. Uh, that is the classic picture of one of the most uh, publicized companies in Ethiopia, Huajan, uh, where you have you know, the stereotypical case of the labor-intensive uh, uh, industry where the localization uh, uh, is, is very, very high. And that contrasts with the kind of jobs, the kind of work that we'll see in the final. This is our team in Angola. And that's the kind of interviewing that we were doing in the construction sites with, you know, unskilled laborers, or in this case, machine operators. And, and you can imagine the sorts of constraints that the teams had to face in terms of finding time to interview and being able to conduct the service uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, due, in due time. So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, over to you, Xiaoyang. Today I will uh, mainly focus on the recent uh, uh, field trip I did in Angola's uh, construction-related sectors. So I actually wrote my first uh, paper on China-Africa, also on Angola's uh, on Chinese employment uh, in Angola. That was 2007. I did my first trip in Africa, and it was in Angola. And that time, actually, several issues about localization, which we discussed, uh, and also the, yeah, the rumor about uh, uh, like not hiring and uh, hiring Angola, and uh, yeah, and also uh, was already there. And in my paper, I already show the the, uh, yeah, the facts, uh, so the numbers I got from the field trip. The Chinese, uh, uh, that time it was uh, on average, uh, so 75% uh, were Angolan workers. And uh, the, but interestingly, this kind of rumor, they didn't go away with uh, all the workers of the researchers, and uh, after 10 years, they are still here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, uh, but in my paper, I also uh, kind of uh, pre uh, through that time, that time the Chinese investment was still very limited. But I also already showed uh, there are trends uh, towards uh, uh, employing more and more Angolan workers uh, when the companies uh, they uh, got familiar with the local situation because of uh, their business logic. You will uh, focus on this. Uh, 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 yeah, you, they will. Uh, they have to employ more local workers in order to save that costs. And uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> trend proved to be true when I visited, revisited the country 10 years later. But before that, I first just described the methodology and so the trip was about uh, two weeks uh, in June and July 2017, and it's uh, uh, complementary to the quantitative surveys Carlos uh, just uh, mentioned. And uh, therefore, uh, I cannot give you all the results uh, in this event, because this will be uh, disclosed with the survey uh, together. And uh, so during that two weeks, uh, uh, I interviewed uh, 24 projects, uh, including uh, 15 construction firms and uh, nine construction material uh, manufacturers. And uh, 
<clears throat> Among them, the SOEs and the private firms, they are mixed. Uh, actually, just uh, here a note, uh, in Africa, for to a large extent, the SOEs and the private firms, uh, their uh, business logic are not so different. They mainly uh, target at uh, getting profit and uh, uh, overseas then for them, the political uh, mission is uh, less uh, has less significance uh, than within China, and uh, uh, mainly the SOEs and private private firms. Their difference is rather like sectors because the SOEs they tend to con uh, concentrate on the construction sector, while the um, private firms they are uh, usually in manufacturing and uh, in service service sector. And uh, uh, SOEs also usually tend to be larger, uh, and uh, private firms, uh, some of them are uh, pretty small, while uh, just a few of them are large. And uh, then I talked to these uh, firms, uh, main, uh, the most of them are the uh, my interviewees are Chinese executives, but also with several uh, local employees. So I can speak a little bit uh, Portuguese. So uh, we also uh, discussed uh, in Portuguese, and uh, the accessibility is uh, it's uh, not a big issue for me because when the uh, Chinese uh, usually I contact the Chinese executives when. And I s said that I want to learn about uh, how you train and manage local employees. They are pretty willing to talk about the, uh, that issue. Some of them even said, yes, we need to uh, talk to you on this thing because that's exactly what we are interested in. What we want, uh, that's uh, where we want to work on. So, uh, yeah, only I think there are uh, one company which is uh, a little bit murky in Angola because they have, uh, yeah, it's a company uh, with, uh, it's a private, it's a uh, private company, and uh, then they got a huge, uh, enormous amount of the contract from Angola government, and I actually even traveled with the boss of that company on the same plane, but uh, even so, he uh, refused to talk to me. Even, and uh, yeah, as, uh, we know in Angola there are something uh, not very clear, but in uh, in La, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> to a large extent, the, uh, the uh, companies, they are, they, are, uh, fr uh, they are friendly to talk to me during my trip. And uh, uh, here are some just uh, very uh, brief uh, yeah, general findings. So first, uh, regarding the number and the composition of workers, so uh, the large difference, so Carlos will have the more detailed comparison between countries. But for me, through the interview, I see the difference is rather sector-based. Uh, because in housing construction sector, we actually see very rapid uh, trend uh, of uh, using increasing number of Angolan workers, one company, one largest uh, like uh, housing constructors in uh, a Chinese constructor in uh, Angola, they used to have uh, a broad. They, at, at the very beginning, their ratio with uh, uh, between Chinese and uh, Angolan workers uh, at the very beginning of their entry was almost a one to one. But then after uh, uh, five years uh, in the second phase of their construction contract, they just have uh, 800 Chinese then versus uh, 5,000 Angolans. So it's a very uh, yeah, dramatic change. 
But uh, in some other sectors, uh, when the more skilled workers are required, then the ratio is uh, much lower. For example, in road construction, where people just need technicians to operate car vehicles, then even today, the uh, ratio is still about uh, 100, uh, yeah, 100 to 100, 100 Chinese to 120 Angolans, such a uh, ratio. And in manufacturing sectors, uh, there's also in, uh, intra-sector difference. In sophisticated factories like a cement factory, it's 60% uh, six, uh, per, uh, of the workers are Angolans and 40% are Chinese. And uh, the same is for steel mill. But in some uh, factories like brick factories, the ratio can be as high as 50%. Uh, Angolans to one Chinese. So in about uh, over uh, tw 200 uh, worker, uh, 200 people factory, only three Chinese managers because uh, they just need to do very simple uh, machine operation or do some uh, very uh, manual labors, while the Chinese just uh, uh, need to focus on the general management and uh, the like machine maintenance. That's uh, uh, yeah, machine reparation. That's uh, um, yeah, the duty for Chinese. And then for the administration section, section uh, Angolan employees uh, usually have a smaller uh, portion. Uh, that's uh, obvious for the reason of uh, uh, language and uh, communication. And uh, Angolan uh, labor law has a quota of 70%. Uh, they, they require companies to hire 70% uh, labor. So it doesn't include the management, but only focus on labor. But the problem is uh, this uh, rule is uh, never strictly implemented. So in 2007, there was already this rule. But even today, there's this rule, but it was never implemented. This one reason is because the Angolan government knows if to implement that rule, you may increase the cost of the construction projects and the factories. And the increasing cost actually, uh, in the end, it's actually need to be paid by the Angolan government itself. So uh, they uh, have this uh, general consideration. And while the, because this is never strictly implemented, they also can not just uh, demand uh, Chinese to do that because uh, this will create unfair uh, you know, competi competition conditions. And uh, then for the reason of uh, using uh, Chinese or using Angolan workers, uh, from the interviews, mainly there are uh, several reasons. For Chinese workers, it's obvious that, uh, as uh, Barry also mentioned, so the Chinese workers, they are more efficient, they are sk more skilled, so they can meet the deadline of, uh, this, of uh, projects. And they also have a better understanding of technical details and the quality requirements. Because Angolan, uh, Angolan workers, uh, uh, it's difficult to find uh, the uh, yeah, very, uh, were skilled workers because of the education system was damaged during the long time, long year civil war, and then uh, better communication is also obvious. Then the preference for Angolan workers, there are several uh, interesting points unique for Angola. Uh, First is uh, the uh, recent uh, like increasing use of Angolan workers. It's uh, uh, caused by the actually exchange rate and the exchange control of uh, the country. So when Angola still was uh, uh, enjoying the high oil price, uh, actually Angolan government, they also do, do not really worry about uh, uh, yeah, um, having um, <coughs> Uh, so they give a very high price uh, uh, contracts and uh, uh, Chinese, uh, they just uh, in, uh, ask Chinese companies uh, to keep a deadline. 
But now, when the oil price uh, um, plump, plump it, uh, dropped, then the uh, contract price is lower, and also it's uh, more difficult for the Chinese to get. Uh, uh, yeah, to, they, they, they also the Angolan control the exchange, and then the Chinese have to use the Angolan workers. So this is also just a very purely business logic, and uh, in another. Another thing interesting is uh, in uh, the actually the Chinese uh, companies they uh, said they, they reported to have more serious labor disputes with Chinese workers rather than with the Angolans because the Chinese workers they have a uh, yeah when you have uh, tens of thousands uh, uh, Chinese workers coming to uh, Angola then they, uh, the management of these people overseas, including their visas, their dorms, and their salary payment, especially if the exchange rate is fluctuating, then that's much more complicated than you just paying the local people with local currency. So in fact, uh, the management with Chinese workers is uh, more difficult. And then there's also political and uh, social concerns. That's mainly for the uh, SOEs. But uh, that uh, uh, is uh, more, emphasis, uh, more emphasized. People reported uh, that the Chinese embassy and also the Angolan government emphasized that more uh, recently in for last two years, uh, that's perhaps also a result of the yeah, uh, national, the Angolan's financial difficulty. But then an, another uniqueness in Angola for this uh, localization process is uh, the security and uh, uh, high turnover of this country. Because in Angola, I think the, in comparison to Ethiopia, the country uh, actually has a less tradition of uh, industry, of non-farming jobs. And uh, then a lot of workers, uh, they are coming from a uh, rural area. And also because uh, in Angola, mainly it's construction companies. Therefore, they rather have uh, this uh, temporary employment. And uh, so therefore, the turnover is very high. And also in Angola, then the security is notorious. Actually, when I was there for during just uh, one week, I heard about a five kidnapping and a robbery. And uh, these people are just near me. Like uh, when I interviewed one company, one manager of a company, and uh, then suddenly he got picked up a phone and uh, said uh, his employees were kidnapped and uh, he had to go there with uh, dollars to uh, pay the ransom. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so uh, this is uh, really a very uh, important uh, case, and then uh, in the employment uh, management, it's uh, uh, important. So the actually the Chinese companies uh, they pay more attention to the workers' loyalty and also their security background rather than their skills. And that's also related to the point that they bring in uh, migrant workers, like Carlos uh, noted. Uh, they, uh, yeah, they would rather uh, hire uh, workers outside uh, in from the village and put them in a compound. That's uh, some way a uh, similar practice uh, like in China. You know, in China there were also uh, millions of migrant workers, but here. They, for some reason, they are similar because uh, migrant workers uh, within a compound is easy to discipline and to manage, but also for some uh, security reasons, which are unique there. Then they offer dorms, and uh, also another thing is Angola, they have some uh, skilled uh, local workers, but they are very expensive, and they tend to stay in uh, government, so that's the contextual issue. And uh, then also another contextual issue is uh, even when Chinese in some contract, they need to train maintenance and operation staff, and they did that. But this staff, then, uh, 
they, because they are so few, the number is so small, and then Angolan government uh, tend to like uh, use them uh, in other promote them, uh, or they may go uh, go to other companies. Then this uh, actually often Chinese found it's difficult to really. Uh, transfer that project to local government because of lack of maintenance stuff. And then subcontracting management in uh, Angola, uh, yeah, I think subcontracting uh, contracting management just here briefly. Then there's also a rule of uh, uh, subcontracting 30% of the uh, contract amount to local uh, companies. This rule was not strictly implemented and was emphasized also recently for the same reason as that local employee rule. And uh, uh, yeah, so it's the low contract price. And the experience with the local subcontractors are mixed. And some companies report the local uh, contractor have no uh, technical capacity. And uh, some may even further subcontract to North Koreans or other uh, countries and uh, delay. Uh, but some also report the, the local companies, they are better at uh, uh, labor management than Chinese. So this uh, just uh, shows there's also a big gap between the local companies. And uh, the Chinese now increasingly, increasingly uh, use uh, the local uh, companies also because the local companies, they accept uh, current uh, uh, quanta. So they do not always uh, require uh, US dollars. Therefore, the local companies now have uh, this advantage Advantage. And then the, the Chinese, they are very conscious now when they subcontract to local companies. They will, they will do very careful contract management to share risks between contractors and the government. Because this 30% rule, if it is implemented, then the Chinese company should say, if there's some delay, then you should not just blame me. That's actually something we should uh, do together, yeah, because uh, uh, it's uh, not only the commercial thing, but also for the country development. And uh, yeah, the strength of local firms that I already mentioned, the, uh, the firms, uh, the labor management and the machine operation, uh, they are fine, but just a week uh, at uh, some uh, machine repairing and also delicate uh, decoration. So some details uh, matters uh, here, just uh, the word. It's the quality management uh, in details. That's the strength of Chinese company and uh, that's also why Chinese, uh, they still keep them work technicians uh, to do a lot of uh, like uh, decoration works and uh, repairing. And uh, this will take uh, perhaps uh, longer. This is actually not a, a matter of education or a training. It's a rather very long ex uh, year experience. Chinese said they themselves need uh, like uh, seven, eight, ten years to really learn these details. Okay, that's uh, my Thank presentation. Um, and I also have a question for Shayang later about subcontractors from North Korea, but okay. maybe you can <laughs> explain a little bit later. Um, thank you very much. Um, it was really fascinating for me to listen to all these presentations. As someone who works a lot on the manufacturing sector in Africa, and specifically in East Africa, I think hearing this level of detail about employment dynamics and employment practices is really extremely interesting. Um, I'd like to raise three main points about what we've heard so far. The first one is really to take a step back and to look at the broader sort of um, manufacturing industrialization agenda. As we know, countries in Africa, and specifically the region that I'm focusing on in East Africa, are really trying to jumpstart their industrialization process. And China is, in this sense, as we've heard, a very important player in this, in this agenda. There are others who have been involved in this um, manufacturing industrialization sector in East Africa, but they've not, so for example, um, countries like Uganda or Kenya have a long history of Asian conglomerates that work in a lot of sectors ranging from agriculture to services to manufacturing as well. 
but they've not managed to achieve the sort of scale uh, that's necessary to kickstart this industrialization process or to strengthen the industrialization process. Um, and Chinese firms are starting or ha are managing to do that, actually. Um, and this is, uh, and, and in a way that Western firms are actually not doing. So there's no investment from Western, from OECD firms in manufacturing in East Africa. Um, and this is not by coincidence. This is because um, Western firms normally have a very different way of operating, very different technology. They're used to a very different sort of investment climate and larger sort of environment. And they find it very difficult to cope with the conditions that are present in, in African countries. And Chinese firms seem to have a much better um, way to dealing with that. Just to give you an example of um, a, a sort of story that's, uh, that you might have heard already. Uh, Rwanda is a relatively small country with only uh, 10 million people. And if you look at Rwandan firms, the largest ones count 500, 600 employees. So, and, the, and there's a handful of them, right? And in the last couple of years, a Chinese firm uh, invested in Rwanda and they opened a garment factory. And this garment factory is exporting to the US under Agoa, they're exporting to South Africa. They're actually producing police uniforms that they export to China. And this factory already employs, last time I checked, they employed 1,000 people. So much larger than other firms that are present in Rwanda, huge source of employment, huge source of exports as well. So this is really interesting. And this is something that, like, uh, working in this sector, this is something to be definitely um, be thinking about. The second point I'd like to raise is around employment dynamics. Um, we have heard that Chinese firms tend to employ a large number of workers from the host country. I think while there has been a lot of discussion around this, I think, I mean, this should actually not be surprising. Firms look at costs, so they want to keep their costs down and they want to minimize their wage bills. Uh, and hiring very expensive foreign expatriates is not the way to, to do it. And on top of that, you often have to work with very complex, very difficult work permits regimes. It's, uh, so when you're trying to set up a firm and you're already fighting with, you know, registering your business or getting your license or setting up your power um, uh, and infrastructure and so on, on top of that, you also have to work with, to have to try to obtain work, work permits. So this is something that firms definitely try to minimize. With, and this has emerged from all the presentations, I think. So Carlos has mentioned about the skills of, uh, of workers of in, in the manufacturing sector of shop floor workers. But we've also talked about sort of higher skills um, workers. And, and I think this is very interesting um, in a way to distinguish in the sort of higher skills, not only between, not only between low skills and high skills, but also within the higher skills to look at the sort of technical skills and managerial skills. So these are skill sets that are necessary to firms. Um, and, and these might be different, and, and the requirements for these might be different. We have talked already about the difference between sectors. So different sectors might have different requirements in terms of the technical skills they need, the managerial skills they need, um, and so on and so forth. So just to give you an example of this, um, we have been working on the garment sector in Myanmar as well. So this is a project we have here at ODI, we've worked with Xiaoyang, and we've interviewed several firms there. So during my last um, trip, to Myanmar, I met with a garment factory. Um, they're producing for uh, a large UK retailer. Uh, so the, the factory, the firm, is Hong Kong. At they have their headquarters in Hong Kong. They have a couple of factories on ma in mainland China. And then they decided that Myanmar is, is going to be the next, the next destination for garment production, so they're going to invest there. Um, so they have set up a factory in Myanmar, which is uh, working quite well, and they've brought with them some expatriate workers for their sort of higher skills um, positions for, you know, doing the sort of quality control, machinery, managerial skills, and so on. And their expat workers are actually from Madagascar and from Mauritius, mostly from Mauritius, so they are actually African. And the lesson there is that countries that have had a long history of um, developing specific sectors can actually develop the skills that are necessary and can export their skills when um, this is required. Um, and this brings me to the last point that I wanted to raise, which is around the sort of 
um, the, the time, the age. So the age of firms, of course, and the age of the sector is very important. And I think what we have been discussing today is a sort of snapshot of the situation right now. I think if we go back in five years, 10 years, 20 years, and look at the same firms or the same sectors in these countries, we might find that in the cases where the sector has managed to grow and to develop, uh, they've also managed to build their skills and build the, the skill set of, of uh, domestic workers. And domestic workers are actually going to be more likely to occupy these sort of higher skill positions. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, ideas to be developed uh, in these discussions, but I'm going to stop here. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Wonderful. We've, we've heard a lot from, from our panelists here. If this is an opportunity for all of you to, uh, to chip in. Please, if, if you have a question, identify yourself. Um, I think I'll start with you. And, and sorry, could we wait for the mic? Because this is a recorded event and, and it won't be picked up on the recording otherwise. Hello, uh, my name's Kate Bird from ODI. Um, I'm currently contributing to a uh, report for the uh, Chronic Poverty um, Advisory Network, CPAN, on pro-porous growth. And um, I'm very interested to hear more, if any of you have any more, on the degree to which the poorest people are engaged in the workforces in uh, the companies that you've researched. And if they are, if you can say anything about uh, the quality of the work that's being provided in terms of the sort of decent work agenda, um, I'd be very interested to put together a case study on that for the report. Okay, <coughs> let's take uh, three questions and then, yeah, there and then there. Hi, hello, my name is uh, Abdurashid Issa. I'm from SOAS. Uh, I'm studying MSc Development Economics. I think my own will be based on the conceptual um, meaning of localization. I think when we um, focus our attention on the number of African workers, I don't think we are looking at it in the best way. Of course, when you have a construction company, you need more uh, workers, like low-level workers, like drivers than managers. So why don't we look at it like um, the percentage of payroll that goes to African workers? If we, are really, if we really want to look at how do African workers uh, benefit from Chinese farms or something more tangible. Numbers, I think, is not going to give um, an accurate picture of localization. We'll do three, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Arti Krishnan from ODI. Um, I, we've got a sense about employment characteristics, but I was wondering about the actual labor conditions. Like, do you see changes in social benefits, for instance? Um, and I mean, where they are casualized labor, and I mean, assuming these construction projects are long and they have gestation periods, was there say, learning by doing, and then these, did these laborers, were they able to move up in any way? And um, also, I mean, a short other question on the research design, like is, um, so this data is obviously not, is it representative of the specific firms that you're looking at, especially when you want to do a counterfactual analysis? And if you've done any form of um, weighing, did you weigh your, sam give sampling weights to your, Data, for instance, depending on the importance of certain characteristics and so on. Good. <clears throat> Let's. Um, I, I take it that that was basically addressed to to the panel. So perhaps we can ask. Uh, let's go from here. Well, maybe I won't address all three of the questions uh, because if we all each yeah. address all three of them, it's going to be difficult. Uh, so why don't I address your question, because it was most directly about uh, how we should measure localization. And I think your point is well taken, that if you just look at uh, the distribution in terms of the workforce between locals and uh, expats, uh, then you only get a very small part of what localization is about. And it's true that you could measure it um, in terms of the percentage of the total payroll that goes to uh, 
either locals or, or people coming from the outside. Uh, but you would have to take into account, of course, the, the skewing of who is employed from the outside because naturally, and despite the talk in the media, there are practically no unskilled Chinese or even semi-skilled Chinese who come to work in Africa. Uh, that is, pretty much everybody who is brought by a Chinese company to work in Africa is somebody with a high level of skills. Uh, for example, uh, among people employed by Chinese-owned mines in Africa, mining is one of the areas where I've done a fair amount of research, uh, virtually all of the Chinese who come to work there uh, in mines in Africa are going to be engineers or highly skilled workers who have had very substantial experience in mines in China or elsewhere in the world. So if you try to figure out the success or non-success of localization uh, based upon looking at percentages of the payroll, uh, it does tell you something that's useful. But it, you have to take into account the fact that you are, in effect, comparing a largely unskilled or semi-skilled local workforce with the rather small number, generally, of Chinese who are almost all highly skilled, and many of whom are professionals. So I, I fully agree that there are many other dimensions to localization besides the one that I talked about and that my fellow panelists talked about. There are, for example, many interesting cultural dimensions with regard to localization. Um, but uh, I think the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is whether or not uh, Chinese companies hire local people. Uh, and that is because so much of what we think about in terms of the whole discourse about China and Africa has been shaped by the media. And as was noted by several panelists, they continue to shape it in a way that is at odds with the uh, empirical reality. Um, OK. First question on uh, degree to which poorest people are engaged. Again, I'd say at the beginning of the presentation, we will disappoint you because we have not analyzed the data yet. But um, the questioners in our sample service of workers included sufficient questions to at least build a socioeconomic status variable, which would allow us to see how relatively poor uh, the, the workers that we sampled are uh, relatively to the national context and also you know, in terms of comparisons across sectors and, and, um, and firms. Um, the, the sort of hunch that I gave at the beginning in my presentation was that my expectation would be because of the type of labor arrangements of some Chinese contractors, this is just for the construction companies in Angola, not in Ethiopia, that one would expect to see probably a larger proportion of very poor workers in those companies compared to Angolan and other foreign contractors. Much, quite a, quite a big difference actually because of the uh, minimum skills that they, they, they require from their own unskilled workers and semi-skilled workers and where they are hiring. So whether they're hiring locally from remote provinces of Angola as opposed to Luanda, that will you know, obviously show up in, this, in these differences. <laughs> and whether these are the poorest of the poor within the country, probably unlikely, but uh, some of them are likely to be uh, probably within the bottom quintile of the, um, of the national income distribution. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm, I'm, I would expect quite a bit of variation, okay? Um, now, on the question of localization, I think Barry has already said something, but let me just provoke you a little bit and say, well, I mean, I don't think the payroll would be a very good measure, actually. Um, so if you, if you just take the, the example of, of Angola, I think that's why the, uh, the issue of, of comparisons is important. I can certainly tell you that Angolan companies have a similar number of expats in those higher level positions. So you go to a well-known Angolan company, a uh, high level contractor, and pretty much 90%, no, actually more than that, of the management and the engineers are from where? Brazil, Portugal. Um, so what is interesting, if I were to do the exercise that you propose, uh, you would likely see a much bigger proportion of payroll in Chinese companies going to the Angolan unskilled and semi-skilled workers 
for the very simple reason that the expat managers and engineers working in the other foreign companies earn three, four, five times as much as the Chinese managers and engineers in the Chinese companies. Um, so but th that is particular to the Angolan context. I'm talking, um, we've that's seen... Still, that's still a finding of interest. It is. It is a finding of interest. So you, you, we've seen uh, uh, machine operators in well-known, actually, Angolan companies, sort of Angolan Portuguese companies, earning five, 6,000 euros a month for one of the top level, you know, more sophisticated machines, just because the company could only trust that person. Uh, of course, you know, if you were to, why would they do that? Well, this, this probably simple explanation is that these companies are getting unbelievably fat contracts from the government anyway. So they can afford to do that. Uh, so which is why, you know, remember what I said at the beginning, the Angolan government is basically treating different segments of contractors differently, according to, you know, where they come from, what links they have, with the uh, regime, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's actually you know, uh, uh, complicated to say. It. I, I do think that the numbers are important because the number of jobs, per se, is an important element. Uh, of course, poorer, unskilled workers receive low salaries compared to the managers. But the impact that that has on their families and the uh, spillover effects of those wages, the, li the wage labor linkages that exist for those people, cannot be uh, discounted. You know, if there's one something that is important about these non-agricultural jobs, is precisely that they are part of the process of labor market formation, which is in an incipient stage. And that is indeed an important aspect of, of, of the whole process. Um, so that's why they, they actually the quantity, the numbers of jobs do, I think, do matter a lot. Um, <clears throat> on, on your questions, Arti, um, um, I can't say much about labor conditions because we haven't analyzed the, the data. By definition, you know, most of the jobs in these sectors are casual. So when people say, well, you know, no permanent jobs are created, I mean, it's, for me, it's, it's actually quite silly, you know, to, especially you know, in, in infrastructure, developing infrastructure construction, the proportion of the workforces that are actually permanent workers are extremely small because of the nature of the sector themselves, okay? So uh, the question is, for example, for one in interesting policy question is, in a context of crisis, which would be interesting to look at in the context of Angola in particular, uh, which firms are more likely to sack workers, including casual and also permanent workers, in the context of slowdown, projects being stopped, etc. And I think that there are some possible differences between different kinds of companies. Okay? Um, the manufacturing sector is creating different types of jobs, much less casualization, at least from what we can observe in the Ethiopian, in the Ethiopian context. And we can't really say much about the, 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 the wages, but in the, in the Ethiopian context, something that is, the, that is a problem at, you know, from the start is that there's no official minimum wage. So a lot of the companies are basically expecting the government to tell them, okay, what is really the minimum that we can start with uh, as a base salary? Because these companies you know, work with the base salary and then they, they top up with all sorts of performance variable uh, components. And I think the setting of that base salary is critical. And if this is set too low, and that's in a sense, the government is also part of that part of, part of that story. Then of course that is going to have an impact on, on. And who are these workers in the context of manufacturing? The sort of factories that are uh, emerging in, in Ethiopia. Uh, 80, 90 percent of that labor force is, is young women from from rural areas. So they, and they don't have. I mean, some of them have very high expectations because what they. Another thing which is interesting. This is something we observe. This is not sweatshop regime, in the sense these are you know uh, newly built, high standard factories in terms, in terms of the infrastructure. Um, so the expectation that some of these women have is that actually the salaries should be higher than what they're getting, but that's also partly because of what they see compared to what they had. Okay, so it's again it's something we will be looking at. In terms of the representativity, um, as I said, within each of the firms that we sample, we followed strict sampling protocols of certified random sample, focus on unskilled. So all the samples will be representative of the firms included. Um, given the problems with the sampling, when you don't have a, an, an adequate sampling frame, having, you know, conducting a, a random sampling is, is silly. So what we had to do is, is basically, you know, go to the top, you know, who are the main employers in these sectors, the top and, and, the, and the top benchmark in terms of working conditions, and that gives you, and comparing like with like as much as possible, okay? Otherwise, and especially in a project like this, this is not a national household survey, it's not a, 
So you need to restrict the total sample, and that is when the purpose of selection of the companies is fundamental. But that follows empirically analytical, analytical criteria. So in that sense, I would say, yes, the sample is certainly empirically analytically relevant. The question of statistical representativity is, is, not, is not relevant in this particular case. Okay, so uh, as uh, Barry and Carlos already uh, responded to most of the question, I just uh, shortly uh, respond to the localization uh, question. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, I think the. <clears throat> So uh, you are right uh, to say the, the number itself cannot uh, just uh, conclude all the localization question. Actually, there are different levels from the numbers, from uh, the positions, and also <coughs> then about uh, the uh, like whether the uh, ownership uh, and the spin-offs of uh, local uh, companies. These are all should all be uh, evaluated. Uh, uh, and uh, I actually, in our research project, not only Carlos, but also other research project uh, in this uh, program, in this ESRC program, we actually have, uh, we are evaluating different uh, aspects of uh, the Chinese uh, impact uh, on this uh, local uh, skill training and the local uh, technology uh, <coughs> acquisition and the local entrepreneurship uh, growth, uh, yeah, different aspects. And uh, regarding the uh, work conditions, then shortly uh, answer is. <coughs> Actually, the, as uh, we mentioned, uh, the uh, Chinese companies, they hired uh, migrant workers and uh, they offer dorms. And uh, in fact, these dorms, they are considered as a benefit or welfare for, by uh, these uh, local employees. So they, uh, yeah, the, uh, we, uh, according to my interview, so, so the uh, companies, uh, they give uh, like uh, every day $5 or six dollars per person this ratio and so along this uh, uh, this is for meals and so the, actually in the companies they can eat much better than home and also their housing conditions uh, in these dorms are much better than like their village and traditional house today because I could not send the pictures it's too large but yeah if there was a chance or next time I can show you the pictures of how these dorms they actually are considered as some benefits. Okay, another round of questions. I think you would. Thanks, thanks for the present presentations. Um, is that is that being picked up? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, a, a, a quick quick question on, on employment dynamics, which I guess is to 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 the panel in general, which is Chinese uh, labor relations are distinguished by the absence of independent trade unions and i'm wondering um how this how this plays out with employment uh employment dynamics uh, with chinese investments in africa where you do in cert certain some african countries where there are independent trade unions sorry i i will get back to these people but i realize i've been sort of directed this way and i know there are a couple of people who have questioned on that side so perhaps you and you and then you know, oh there's a mic over there great Thank you. So I would like to say thank you to the panelists. That was really, really interesting. Uh, my name is Lotta Takalagrinish. I'm a senior lecturer at UWE Bristol. Uh, uh, the question I want to ask w was uh, about the forms of employment. So there was a bit of a mention about casual employment. Did your research uncover the use of informal, seasonal um, labor brokers? Uh, so when you said employers, you interviewed employers, they might say, I work for this company, yeah. and you work there once a year, and so on and so forth. And um, what were the implications, if you like, from your research? Um, Dirk de Velde, I'm here from the ODI. Um, and I've got uh, two types of interest here. I'm part of the growth research program, um, but I'm also uh, heading up the supporting economic transformation program here at 
at ODI, and I've got two two um, two questions. Um, one is that it's really important, I think, to get uh, much more data uh, and evidence around uh, the sort of the, the questions that that were put up uh, at the start about localization rates and so on. To get deep uh, analysis on that, and 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 you do that, and I think that's really really great. Um, but maybe I could push you a bit more around the sector differences um, around localization rates. So about localization rates, I think we heard about the first presentation was about 75 to 80 percent, but there was also about uh, a discussion that it's very sector specific. And what I could imagine is that in the garment sector, it's much more closer to 80, 90 percent or so. And in the construction sector, I think that Zhao Zhang was mentioning 100 to 120. So maybe there it's more like 50 percent. And if that's the case, I think it would be quite interesting to see if there is if there is, are um, uh, really significant differences across sectors. I um, mean, by casual observation, I would say that indeed in the road road sector, um, the the localization rate is much 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 lower. Um, in uh, I, I was in Machakos, for example, in uh, two three weeks ago, to the north uh, of Machakos. There's lots of road building going on to the north. There's a project run, uh, not by the Chinese, in the south um, uh, to Machakos. It was run by the Chinese. Um, the Chinese contractors and workers. Um, decided to leave the country because of the, 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 the problems around the election, just like many other uh, international organizations and, <laughs> and other staff actually left the, the country. And that's, those projects were, 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 were stopped, whereas to the north, it wasn't run by the, by the, by the Chinese and those projects were, were still, still running. So I suppose that tells me a bit of a story that I suppose uh, the localization rates are a bit less for, for road building uh, wor uh, works. Um, but it will be interesting to sort of see whether that is uh, whether that's significant. But um, um, another question is around um, the link perhaps to, to management uh, um, uh, and the performance of management of companies and whether Chinese companies, Indian companies, uh, particularly Chinese companies in this case, can get more out of the, out of the workers compared to other, uh, other uh, companies. I don't know whether you look into that, but there's uh, quite a big literature now going on around the importance of management uh, to the, to, to, for the performance of, uh, of firms. So is it indeed the case that uh, better th that that Chinese firms are better managed um, uh, than than other firms? Uh, is the productivity higher of these workers, or is actually the opposite the case that that uh, and that's sometimes what I hear, particularly in Kenya, is that motivation of workers uh, in 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 Chinese or Indian-owned firms is actually less, and therefore the productivity of workers is also lower in 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 uh, in, in Chinese and, and Indian-owned. Uh, uh, firm. So it would be interesting to see whether you have something to say on that. But I've, I found it very interesting and I'm really looking forward to, to, to following the, the, the project um, and the results. Why don't, why don't we ask Xiaoyang to, to start we'll and we'll go back this way. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe, yeah, I just uh, first uh, regarding the union uh, uh, unionization. Uh, yeah, in fact, that's uh, something the Chinese, uh, actually the employee, uh, the Chinese companies in these countries, they already uh, realize uh, the importance, also sometimes the danger of unionization. Yeah, so actually they, uh, to some extent, if the law, yeah, so in, some com in some companies, uh, when the law regulates there should be unions, uh, then they actually have to uh, conform to that. But uh, if possible, then they try to avoid uh, unionization, especially some uh, experienced uh, companies in Ethiopia, then they uh, try to uh, yeah, kind of uh, uh, avoid, uh, prevent uh, union coming into their companies within the legal framework. And uh, uh, this actually, uh, Barry had more experience, especially in Zambia, because there the union, uh, their strength is more powerful. While in the two countries we investigated, Ethiopia and uh, Angola, the union's power is uh, rather yeah, weak than in comparison to Zambia. And uh, then uh, m maybe I just uh, uh, for the f uh, seasonal employment, maybe I leave it to you. And uh, then uh, I got about the sector difference. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, the, uh, as uh, Dirk uh, also pointed out, uh, there's a significant uh, sector di uh, difference. Uh, like in some uh, part, uh, the uh, shoe making, garment, uh, and also simple brick factories, uh, you may have uh, this uh, uh, 100 to 1 or uh, 50 to 1, this ratio. And uh, so even when we say it's a uh, one, even let's say just a textile, this gen so it's a, uh, even within a category textile, there may also be like uh, the garment making and then this uh, weaving meal. This also have a different uh, uh, th uh, ratios uh, due to the different uh, technical uh, 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 yeah, technical features. But here, I the one thing is uh, in. Uh, Generally speaking, we would say these sectors with more uh, labor intensive, these labor intensive sec sectors, they are more in Africa. That it's obvious uh, that uh, Africa's uh, manufacturing first, uh, it's also often labor intensive. And also uh, when the Chinese, they invest in Africa, they tend to use a labor intensive approach. For example, there are the ways uh, to use automatic machines uh, or to use uh, these uh, highly sophisticated uh, vehicles. But uh, the Chinese think, uh, yes, in, uh, in Africa, especially in Ethiopia, the workers, they are cheaper. Why don't uh, we rather use the laborers uh, to, yeah, then to save the cost on these machines? So therefore, they tend to use these labor-intensive approaches. So yes, there are some sectors like the road construction. You have to use uh, uh, these machines. That's why, uh, yeah, this cannot be replaced by labor. So that's why then there's uh, this high ratio of te Chinese tech. Technicians. But uh, if possible, then in most of the sectors, uh, the Chinese uh, would uh, cho choose this uh, uh, more labor intensive approach. And about uh, productivity, I think uh, here uh, my, uh, my opinion is. Uh, it rather uh, varies between companies, not really varies between uh, nationalities. So even within Chinese companies, some companies, uh, for example, in this uh, shoe making uh, in Ethiopia, I can see uh, for last five years, the Huajian, they are significantly, their productivity improvement is better than other uh, two Chinese companies. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. On the question, partly on the trade unions, um, so I what Ray uh, say something. Let me just say that overall, yes, trade union unions are very weak in both Ethiopia and Angola, and uh, particularly in Angola. And I would even venture to say that calling a union independent in Angola is a bit of a, a stretch. Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, Ethiopia and Angola. I think Ethiopia is, is a mixed bag. It really depends on the sector. The unions are actually quite active in some sectors and so on. And the other interesting thing is, is that leads to quite interesting contrast in perceptions. As, as Xiaoyong just said, uh, there seems to be a perception among Chinese managers that these countries are very unionized and unions are very important. You know? But th their perception seems to be that the unions are far more important than they actually are. Um, and I think that might be uh, because of what they've been told and also their, their direct experiences. Uh, because certainly, you know, when you look at, you know, some of these sectors and the, the national domestic firms, you know, they barely touched um, ever uh, um, by, by trade unions. Uh, but I think it's partly that, you know, some trade unions, trade unions sometimes they're also quite selective in terms of, you know, where they operate. And generally, you know, it's easy to see that foreign firms are a clear target and this is my hunch. I think Chinese firms are a particular target in some countries more than others. I don't, but I wouldn't be able to really generalize on this. Um, we'll see. I mean, we have questions on trade union membership in the, in the service, so we will be able to say something about differences. <coughs> on informality, seasonality, um, and labor brokers. So let me just go labor brokers first. That was a very interesting finding. Barely, it's very, very hard to find instances of, of, uh, of these sort of cascade of labor brokers and subcontracting that you find in many other parts of the world. Uh, there's a lot of direct employment, actually. 
uh, much more than, than we expected, and particularly in Angola, it's really hard to find the, the, this notion of labor agents as labor brokers only in some services sectors more than anything, but not in these in these sectors. In the construction sector, of course, as I say, a lot of the work is is rather than seasonal project related. Okay, so it does have an end. We do have questions in the question about you know what is the expectation from workers in terms of how long they're going to stay in the company, and, and I think most of the time this is uncertain. Okay, um, all, of course, according to the labor law, the regulations about you know after so many months you're supposed to be permanent, but uh, as I know from my work in the agricultural sector, these, uh, these labor laws can very easily uh, be managed just by you know, sacking the workers and then re-employing them one week later. I mean, everyone is doing that in agriculture, which is, makes it so, so seasonal. Uh, but just an interesting uh, uh, fact about, for example, certain types of works. I mentioned the rural-based workers going to fa some factories, uh, even in Angola, but also to construction sites. But in the case of factories, usually these jobs are not, are not casual. Not least because the, the company is engaging on the job training, they invest in some of the training, and, and their priority is to retain, especially some of the best workers, not to uh, get rid of them. And one, one problem that many companies seem to face, typically Chinese because they, they bring all, many of these workers from rural areas, is that the workers go back to the villages during the uh, rainy season for farming. Uh, so they actually uh, introduce their own seasonality in, into their job. And for them, it doesn't mean that they're dropping their jobs. They're actually going back to the factory. And, they, you know, and interestingly, a lot of them actually get their jobs back. But that was a huge problem for some, some, of, the, some of the managers. And the employees themselves did acknowledge that that was, that, was, that was a practice that was quite common because they had to go back. Okay? So the, the, and that's also partly the, the uh, reflects that the, this is a transition stage in terms of you know, building an industrial non-agricultural workforce and still people basically with you know, two feet in different sectors. Okay? Um, the differences across sectors, yes, very <laughs> quite significant differences in terms of localization. But also within the same sectors, I think uh, Xiaoyang already mentioned. So if you look at construction, clearly those projects are more skill intensive, like you, know, you need um, fine skills on decoration, like even plastering for certain types of uh, high, very high quality projects. The, le the level of localization is much lower than for other projects in which this is not a major requirement. Also, when uh, depends a lot on, on the relative importance of deadlines for the projects. That t tends to have an impact on, on the localization within the same uh, sector. But on the productivity, um, again, from the qualitative research we've done, if you look at the garment sector, the standards tend to be quite uh, common across factories, but the different factories do differently in terms of you know, the usual time uh, seconds per operation and uh, these uh, ratios of efficiency. Uh, what we got from these interviews was a sense that uh, for shop floor workers, for production workers, is actually relatively easy with given time, so two, three to four years, to reach efficiency levels that are comparable to Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam was you know, usually mentioned as one of the top in China, of course, uh, in terms of these time efficiencies. Um, but it takes, you know, it takes time. And what was interesting about this is that they say that one of the major bottlenecks for, uh, to reach these, these higher efficiency levels is not the actual production workers, is the um, um, factory supervisors. So those who supervise the production lines. This is where you know, they find that uh, they're not sufficiently good at problem solving and troubleshooting when there is a bottleneck in a, in a production line. Whereas the individual production workers, you know, they, they can be trained, and in, in a matter of months, they actually reach quite decent levels of productivity. So of course, there will be variations depending on those companies that operate in global production networks for big buyers. They, they tend to be the best in terms of reaching these efficiency levels in shorter time. Those who operate for the domestic market in building materials industries, etc., it's a completely different story. Well, for the first question about the uh, absence of unions, um, as it happens, I've done field work principally in Zambia, and Zambia is a mining country, and uh, one of the principal areas of my research had to do with uh, miners. Uh, and those mining unions had a long history of sharp struggle against the employers. Uh, and when Chinese companies came there, uh, they were uniformly hostile to unions. 
Uh, and I think this applies not only to the mining sector, but to many other sectors. So that was when I first started out doing research, say 10 or 12 years ago, every Chinese boss that I talked to was hostile to unions. And in part, this was because they had the idea that unions make outrageous wage demands, uh, and also that the unions wanted to enforce rules, which were legal <coughs> rules in various African countries, which they thought would inhibit the process of production. But what's interesting over time is that as I've re-interviewed these Chinese bosses, not only in the mining sector, but in uh, construction and other industries, they have gradually come to uh, accept the presence of unions, which they're legally required to do, of course, and in, in most cases, uh, but also because they think now that uh, the unions, uh, being not political in nature, uh, or only political in the, the, the sense of supporting this or that party for the, to be in government, but not having goals beyond higher wages, better working conditions. They actually think that uh, now they can work with the unions to ensure industrial discipline, to obviate strikes, etc. So they adopted basically the same position uh, that capitalists in uh, many capitalist countries typically do adopt with regard to unions. They want to tame the unions uh, to make them apolitical and to ensure that they don't go beyond uh, making wage demands and talking about working conditions which could be the subject of bargaining. Uh, of course, as was already noted, uh, unions in most sectors in Africa are relatively weak, but even in these stronger sectors, where unions with histories of militancy are, are present, uh, nevertheless, the attitude of uh, Chinese bosses now is it's uh, better to join them than to try to beat them. Um, as for um, informal work, um, maybe this is not quite the right term to use with respect to employment at Chinese companies in Africa. What there is uh, is still a lot of workforces that have no contract. That is, uh, they are subject of an oral agreement or even nothing at all, uh, even though the law may require that a contract be provided to them. Uh, so not only are they not permanent workers, but they are workers without contracts. And this is, of course, not something that occurs just at Chinese-owned firms, but at firms more generally. In fact, in the locally-owned uh, aspects of the economy, it's even less common to find that workers have contracts, let alone that they are hi hired permanently. And of course, in certain sectors, uh, it's obvious that people are only going to be employed uh, from time to time. I'm from a, a family of construction workers, and I know very well that a you work for a little while, then you're unemployed, then you work for a little while longer. And this is the case, of course, in the construction sector in Africa as well. Uh, with regard to differences in localization across sector, uh, something's already been said by my colleagues, uh, but I should add that there are a couple sectors where I think uh, localization is necessarily lower than it is in other sectors. One is IT. Uh, there are two primary Chinese companies operating in Africa in the IT sector. That's Huawei and Zhongxin, ZTE. And at these companies, the rate of localization is necessarily uh, significantly lower than in other sectors because the work is at a very high, <coughs> high level of skill and it's simply difficult to find enough people who have been trained although the percentage of local people working at those two very big companies that are operating in, uh, across Africa uh, has been increasing over time. But it's still difficult because even if people come to work there, uh, then they jump to some other local company, South African company, or uh, to an indigenous company, and difficult to retain people in that sector. The other area where there's relatively low localization it has to do with very small traders. Uh, and these are like mom and pop stores. Uh, and they mainly employ relatives from China. Uh, of course, this is true all over the world. Uh, but 
the, they still have a significant number of local workers. The average, and there's been surveys done about this, the average for these mom and pop small scale traders from China is to employ six to eight local workers. But then again, you know, they're going to have six to eight people from their family who are working in the shop. So the ratio then comes down to like half and half or something of the sort. Um, and then the, the question having to do with productivity, my colleagues have already answered that uh, basically, but I just want to add uh, one thing about it. The question that you raised about motivation of uh, workers at Chinese firms compared, I guess, to motivation of workers at uh, other foreign-owned enterprises or local workers, or local enterprises. Um, I, I don't think any really clear findings have been established in that regard yet, but uh, I will say that there are two factors which I think are important in terms of lower motivation among workers at uh, Chinese firms, if indeed there is lower motivation. And one would be, of course, uh, lower wages generally paid at Chinese firms. And I've already talked when I gave my presentation about some of the factors uh, which mean that there will be lower wages, although the gap between what other foreign-owned firms pay and what Chinese firms pay has been narrowed over time. And so there isn't a huge difference anymore, but there still is a difference. And of course, motivation is very closely tied to how much you're getting paid. If you feel like you're getting paid less than you should be getting paid, or less than your brother who's working at the firm across the street, then obviously your motivation is going to wane. Uh, the other factor, maybe it's even more important, is that in certain African countries, there is a political discourse about the Chinese. And this political discourse is highly prejudiced. Uh, but even beyond prejudice, which is, of course, again, common all over the world, uh, is that it's highly political. That is to say, uh, in certain African countries, particularly in Southern Africa, uh, political parties that are in opposition will use the Chinese factor as a way to criticize the government. And if they are doing that, that means that a lot of people in the country are hearing certain things about the Chinese, uh, which may or may not be accurate. And if they hear those things, which are negative, of course, then uh, they are going to have a negative feeling about their Chinese employers that they might not have if they were working for a different set of employers. All that being said, uh, since I've interviewed workers who have worked for local firms, I can tell you that their morale, uh, their enthusiasm is generally quite low because they get even lower wages. And because uh, the bosses uh, feel they can treat them in any way they want to treat them because after all they're co-nationals, uh, often their working conditions are worse than in Chinese firms. And therefore, uh, you could expect that their work enthusiasm would be less. Unfortunately, there's not, uh, we've run out of time. I know there are quite a number of questions. I didn't even address the missing middle here. Um, uh, so the, the good news, however, is that there is a reception, I think, next door, is that yeah. right? So it becomes an opportunity for you to, to uh, talk to the individual speakers themselves. Thank you very much.